Okay, thank you so much, Sophie. Um, can everybody hear me? I hope you all can see my screen and you all can hear me clearly. Um, so I'm very happy to be here. Uh, my name is Deborah. Um, I, I, you know, I'm part of the She Secures community. I'm very happy to contribute and really excited to, you know, help out the team and the founders here. Um, I've had about 10 years in security um, and IT in general, um, working from, you know, pen testing back in the day to cyber risk quantification, cyber strategy, um, third party security, vendor management. And, you know, security is a, is a passion of mine. And uh, I love to do CTFs and reverse engineering is something I'm really passionate about. Um, so I'm really happy to be here and, um, you know, give you kind of like an introduction to what reverse engineering is all about from a cybersecurity perspective. Um, a, a, a quick jump into, you know, the kind of tools we use and, you know, like how to get started overall. Um, so looking forward to also Roomcast session after this. And I'm just going to kick this off. Um, so typically you would see uh, uh, views like this of like a, a terminal on a security engineer's uh, uh, computer and it's like, oh, some lines of assembly code, you know, they're looking at C code, trying to identify where bugs are. That's a good place to jump into, looking at the tools, looking at how to use them. But in cybersecurity, I like to take it a step back. Yes, technical skills are very important, but we need to understand the why. So if you're in the security operations team, why, how does your role um, I, I, impact the broader cybersecurity strategy? If you are in the offensive security team, how does your role impact the broader cybersecurity strategy and even the business goals itself? So taking a step back, um, we will go to an agenda of how we're going to break it down. Uh, take a look at the cybersecurity threat actors, um, their motivations, and attack vectors for how to get into different organizations. Two, so we'll look at a defense in depth strategy, um, looking at the data to how the, it's traversed across the network and where reverse engineering sits in that um, stack. Next, we'll look at some exploit reports. What is actually happening, ev happening every day? Where will reverse engineering be applied? Well, how can we see outputs of that? And um, four, we're now going to more technical details. Um, looking at the levels of abstraction in computer language that are good for to consider if you want to go into reverse engineering. Um, then we look at the vulnerabilities and protection mechanisms for binary security and the tools as well. Now we get into the tools and um, the key thing, number, number seven of the key thing of how memory works, which is a differentiating factor for how, how the kind of technical skills that are needed in, in this domain. And lastly, we'll look at a, a, a simple buffer overflow vulnerability. Um, now to, to, to go ahead there, looking at the cyber threats and actors. Now on the, on the left, you know, there is a why for what, you know, why there are hacks and data breaches that are announced everywhere. You know, it could be nation state attacks due to geopolitical considerations from one country or one region wanting to secure or have a higher cyber power or cyber control than another nation state. Um, it could be for profit purposes, you know, cyber crim criminals wanting to get access to banks and, you know, get access to financial profit. And um, it could be ideological. So if there are people that are hacktivists and have a particular belief system or feel like their human rights are being violated, that could be a motivation for why hacktivists would try to um, breach, a a breach a security system or IT system or a website. Um, it, it could be ideological violence, you know, terrorist groups, extremists. It could be for satisfaction, thrill seekers. And I hope people that are doing it for thrill seeking would do it in an ethical manner. So CTFs and, you know, blue team um, um, approach. And, and, and finally is discontent because of insider threats. Um, so look at, when we look at the motivation and we look at the cyber threat actors, um, now we look at the top 15 cyber threats that ANISA, that's the European body for cyber security. Last year, they identified the top 15 cyber threats that are facing organizations right, right now. So you look at malware, you know, web-based attacks, the, the typical phishing, spam, denial of service, and all of those avenues by which um, an actual data breach could occur. Once an organization is able to know, you know, the breadth of the threats that they could have. So, for example, maybe uh, a financial institution might not have specific, might not face specific threats compared to uh, 
um, an educational sector organization, understanding those threats and now being able to define a defense in-depth strategy for that. And here we see at the core of it all, at the core of it all is the data and ensuring that there's confidentiality, um, integrity, availability, non-repudiation for an authentication, you know, authorized access to that data and being able to control that. Now, in the days, in the day of tech, like everything's on the, on the cloud or in some servers on-prem, highly do you see hardware? So a lot of that data is processed on applications and that application is hosted on a server somewhere or hosted on a local system. And when you want to transfer data, it goes through an internal network. If it has to go to an external network, it has to pass through the perimeter security. And then you now have to look at the physical security of that data. And finally, the policies, procedures, and awareness for the employees to protect that data. Um, so at each of those tiers in a defense and depth strategy, I like to go with a defense and depth strategy and a defense and breadth. At each, at each layer, there's also multiple steps you can take to secure it. Um, so at each step of the, at, at, at each layer in the defense and depth strategy, you are looking at various controls as well. So for example, um, in the data domain here, you're looking at database security. Um, in application layer, you're looking at authentication, you know, federated models with single sign-on and trust. You're looking at um, host level platform security, physical level fences, walls, locks, keys, badges. But what is important for those that are interested in reverse engineering and binary security? And that is the layer at the host. So the platform, which is the operation system, and um, vulnerability ma uh, management processes, because you'll be getting updated patches, you know, from different vendors, and you will want to install those. But how are you sure that even the bug fix you're receiving doesn't already have a security vulnerability? You know, so looking at that avenue to be able to test patches that you receive before you actually deploy them to your production environment. Um, and then looking at malware protection as well, because all of those are still, you know, um, binary files or applications you, or system utilities that can be exploited to gain privilege access or carry out unauthorized um, activities. If we go into the next view of how that is important, and we've streamlined it from the top down to how um, critical reverse engineering is in the overall security ecosystem. And here you're seeing malware analysis. If you have a, if there's a, new, a zero day um, application in the wild and you want to, you know, go step by step into the logic of, of that, of, of that target, target binary to know what it does, reverse engineering can actually help you there. Um, in patch verification, to go step by step to make sure that even the bug fixes you got, you know, a new line of code hasn't been included that will cause a, 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 an unauthorized um, action on your environment. You know, even if you trust your supply chain, anything can happen on the way to how it's the, 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 the resources being delivered onto you. So how do you secure that? Um, third bullet points we have there is security testing. So if you're part of an internal team's um, offensive security team and your organization um, deploys secure SDLC software development life, life cycle processes, you need to do tests on all of that code and um, to be to ensure that you're not actually exposing your end users to more vulnerabilities. And finally, CTFs, capture the flag competitions, you know, to, to continue to fine tune your technical skills, skill sets, and you know, going to gamifying um, gamified security approaches and just you know stay in touch with the community. Reverse engineering can really be. Uh, a, a good skill to, 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 to contribute as well to the security commun community. Um, now that we've looked at that a little bit, I want to I want to show it show, show show what that looks like um, overall. Um, I'm going to quickly do another screen share here. So if you want to understand like um, where are the possible places to look for um, vulnerabilities that have been reported you know so you can go to the the mitre.org website and look at the cve database cve is just common vulnerabilities and exploits and it's only for the known ones um there are still zero day which is a, a unique skill set that um is really needed in in, in, in cyber security security community um but there are known vulnerabilities that you can find on here um on the cve database 
kind of understand what were the flaws, what could have what could have gone wrong, what could be the impact on the on the on the organization's um, IT environments if there was a successful exploit, um, and be able to identify areas to fix it. So you can see some CVEs from 2021, as recent as 2021. Those are known ones. Would expect our vulnerable for vulnerability management vendors to have identified the to have included the identifiers for such gaps within the database to do scans and you know alert the, the security team or the patch management team that oh there's a likely vulnerable solution within your environment. At the same time, I think where where is important to really develop a skill is being able to anal analyze do like black box testing and go from a part of being able to identify zero day vulnerabilities. Things are not on the CVE list at all, you know, and it could be a, a, a bad actor that knows about the vulnerability and is actively exploiting it, but one of the trusted security team don't know about it and haven't, you know, um, and haven't actually um, created a, a, a patch or a fix for it. Um, so that is that is somewhere I think it's it's really critical for for us to kind of like get better at and and, and really contribute contribute there. So looking at the CVE database, I'm gonna pick one simple utility as an example um, that we use every day. If you if you use Linux systems um, and you are a normal user, a non-privileged user, but you want to carry out a privileged activity, you typically do like sudo maybe to change a password or change a, a network configuration setting on your on your PC or on your, or, or a Linux server, you will use sudo, which is switch user to like a higher privilege and do this. Um, in, in using sudo, you need to be able to put uh, uh, the password or credentials of a, a more privileged user. But there are times where even the even those type of utilities can be bypassed that a non-privileged user who doesn't have the password of a privileged user is able to control the uh, control the to hijack the control flow the logic of those of the application of the of the utility to gain that privileged access that they shouldn't have they shouldn't be able to have in the first place and here we're just looking at the, at, at the first stretch of the list here right and um, if you just go to cve.mytory.org type any application or utility that you're looking for. Typically you should see it here. Um, I had sudo open, but if, if we look at quite a number of them, there is um, CVE 2021 and, and, and the identifier 313156. And if you scroll down, you'll see quite a number of different um, vulnerabilities that were identified in the sudo, sudo utility. Uh, look at the first one and, and, and what it says. Um, the pseudo utility before this version contains a one an off by one error that can result in a heap based buffer overflow, which allows privilege escalation to root via pseudo edits hyphen s and a command line arguments that ends with a single backslash character. Now this is a heap based buffer overflow. There are different types of buffer overflow um, vulnerabilities, and we'll go into an example of a really basic one um, in, in this workshop. But this is just to demonstrate that this is pretty cool things that are happening out there in terms of being able to identify um, zero days, test new updates that vendors push out or your security team or your development team push out and really drill into making sure that there is no um, there is no vulnerability in it. So sometimes you can see the, the CVE on here, but if you go a bit further, you will be able to find, you might be able to find active exploits that could actually take advantage of that vulnerability to to execute um to execute on, on, a, on a target system and gain privileged access and if, if if we go into studio again here um sorry uh if we go into studio uh and do a search on exploits.db.com i don't know this was put together by rapid seven some time ago i don't know whether it's the same company but you will, you will be able to see potential exploits here for different um, um, versions of sudo. You know? So we had seen the vulnerability before and you can go in here, um, identify the exploits and you know, do a proof of concept for, for an organization of how vulnerable um, the, 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 the systems will be to, to this weakness. 
Um, so while while this is um, really really good, I will still emphasize again that zero day is the way to go. Identifying things that are not even on a CVE, being able to grow your reverse engineering skills and be able to even report new vulnerabilities yourself and publish new vulnerabilities um, on, on on the CVE database. Um, so going on to the next part, and this is where it's we go. We now go into what to what, what we're all here for, um, for this session. Um, what is important in in reverse engineering in in terms of how you see computing languages is the part around assembly language and machine code. So we're familiar with the usual, you know, Python, Python three now, which is more secure. Um, there is mid level languages like Java and C. And then what the what the machine understands is usually assembly and machine code. So it's typically really good to be able, we, we can't understand machine code, of course, um, but it's typically um, really good to be able to understand um, assembly language um, and be able to um, write exploits from there. Or when you take an application and you decompile it, it's going to come out in your in your um, in your in your tool in assembly code usually. So it's good to be able to know how to read those. And it's pretty easy. It's just another language. Take, take it step by step to, to understand it. Um, so yes, assembly language is, 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 is important. Um, being able to know a little bit about um, hexadecimals um, and you know binary numbers to know what's happening. And because the memory in, in, in computing is usually in hexadecimals. So being able to just do some basic calculations um, with that. To, 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 to do your proof of concepts or verify a, a zero day you have, you've identified. Um, on to the next part, which is examples of um, buffer overflow vulnerabilities, or not even buffer overflow vulnerabilities, but binary um, vulnerabilities and binary security. So one is buffer overflow. And what it means is there's a buffer, there's a, some space, you're literally just overflowing it. Now, if you're overflowing it, you're going to you potentially going to a part in memory that you're not supposed to access. So if you have an eight um, an eight character buffer for um, for a, a, a string or a, a string of alphanumeric characters, after that the machine knows that the next part in memory is supposed to be executing um, some instructions. But if you're able to manipulate it, you can actually overflow that buffer to go to that restricted part of code. And in memory allocations, there is stack, there is heap, like we saw for the studio vulnerability. Um, but in the stack part, and we will focus on that because that's like a good place to, to, to start. Another type of vulnerability we'll typically see is return-oriented programming. So if you have developers that are um, really good about making sure that buffer overflows won't happen and they make sure, oh, if, they have a buffer that's supposed to take a certain length of input from a user. It's they put a check within their code to make sure that the user has not imputed more. And if the user imputed more, they just discard the extra. So they can't really manipulate the memory stack. Um, so what, what attackers can do is go a step further to look at the return-oriented programming approach, which uses um, which uses utilities that are already or they call it gadgets which uses gadgets that are already within trusted utilities. So instead of me putting like a, a hundred bytes length of an exploit into a, a terminal, um, and it's only going to take five, I can go through the code itself that the developer has built or the libraries that they've imported for that code to run and it, it identify ways I can patch together different functions to build my full exploits, even though I just have five characters that are allowed in the buffer overflow, um, in, in the buffer impute. Um, the third bit there is format string. And you know that's another area around being able to leak information. And that was very, that was obvious in the heart, in the heartbeat um, um, vulnerability um, years back. Um, if you want to research some more about it, you can, you can take a look online. Um, here as well, usually for different um, binaries, if you're on Linux, the easiest way to check how secure your your binary is or your target application is is to use like checksec um, and then the utility name. So checksec sudo, for example, 
And here you'll see like five different protection mechanisms that should be in place for that binary. Um, so there is Canary, there's Spotify, non-executable stack, Pi. Um, we'll go into a few of them quickly. Uh, so the first one is stack canaries. This on the, on the side is a super vulnerable um, utility, easy to, 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 um, to do some POCs on it if you want, because there's no canary, there's no fortify. But what do those really mean? So remember when we talked about there being a long string of, um, a, a long, a, 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 a particular length of input that can be taken into um, a, a standing, if you have five characters, but you put maybe 10 characters into memory, what the code does is it hides some checker string somewhere in memory so that when you put five characters, when you put 10 characters, it takes the first five, then it compares your remaining five where you've tampered with the stack memory. It takes your remaining five and now compares it with its own hidden canary somewhere else in memory. And where it's different, you know, your exploit will fail. So stack canary should always be enabled. Um, Non-executable stack as well um, should always be enabled because if, you know, there is kind of like an advanced um, exploit command that's passed and is targeting the stack, um, it will actually execute. So usually making your um, stack memory itself not to be executable is really important. Address space layout randomization is critical as well. And what it means is every time your application is run, the address always changes. The, ad the address that's called at runtime is always different. So those are just um, high level techniques that are high level vulnerabilities and protection mechanisms. There are like lots of papers on these that you can um, explore to, to know be better or yeah. Um, and next here is the tools. Um, I don't wanna go into each of these in detail because they are, you know, um, we will go through it when we're looking at the, at the demo of what um, um, a buffer overflow on a stack looks like. Um, but the GDP pawn, pawn DBG debugger is, is super important, critical, is almost indispensable for a lot of, a lot of reverse engineers. Um, and GDB itself is the main debugger, but a good utility to add to your GDB when you install it is pawn DBG, and you can find that on GitHub. Um, there is also Jydra as well. And what Jydra does is, is kind of like a static um, analysis of your, of, your, of your target utility. Um, you, you, you bring in the, the, the target binary or the utility, and then it decompiles it as much as, as best as it can to show you the, the code and the lines of code, and you can be, get a better understanding of um, what is actually happening and identify if there are any possible vulnerabilities. Um, OBJ dump pretty much does the same thing as Jydra, but it's pretty much in terminal. Some, some our reverse engineers like to use it because they can just do a control, they can type the output to um, a, a notepad and just do a control F for certain functions. Um, pawn tools is if your if you're targets, if you don't have the actual utility um, to test manually and important to Jydra, with pawn tools, you can do a remote test. So if you know the IP address and the port number, of the target utility, you can do a, a, a remote um, test or CTF with, with, with pawn tools. And, and finally, just because of resource considerations, I would recommend you use Linux OS on, on a virtual machine to do this, um, or even your host machine can be, can be Linux and then VirtualBox or, or VMware on that. And then um, Ubuntu is widely supported um, and easiest to get your, to get to, to not have any <laughs> thing breaking um, in your test environment. Um, yeah, so those are the tools. We'll take a look at them in a bit, um, but still a little bit on some theory of why, why buffer overflow and why stack. If, if we look at this, the way memory, computer memory works is, is just like a filing system where you have different processes oh, and then you just say, oh, put the paper here, put the paper here, to-do list, to-do list, to-do list, and it stacks up. And as you address each one, you take the first to the list, 
that reduces the stack and it goes from up from top to bottom. Um, so let's look at this example here. Let's say you have four different functions or the CEO of a company has four different departments and each one of them comes in at different times to ask him to do stuff for them. So they come in, they, they put um, his to-do list within his, his, his file cabinet and it's like, the first department comes in here, puts, he hasn't attended to it. The next department comes and puts number two, Number three comes and you know puts their own um, request to their own function that they need him to address. Um, he pops it out from there, addresses department three's um, request. Department four comes back and says, oh, here is more. They push that to the stack. And when he's looking at it, he can jump to one. He will first look at four, then look at two, then look at one. So, you know, Push, push, pop are really important things to know when you're looking at assembly language and the stack on the stack and knowing and knowing what's happening there. Um, next, we're very close to the to to, to a, a hands-on piece um, of of how this will work. But let's take a simple application that we're going to be exploiting, and it, it's written in C, um, and it's just to give you an idea of how you can do reverse engineering and identify the vulnerability on a uh, on, 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 a, on a binary file. So when you, when you compile this, usually the computer will read everything from main. So it will always starts to always search through the lines of code. It will identify where there is main here and whatever is in main is what only what it should execute. So it will execute what is in main or any other function that is called by main or any other function that is called by the function called by main. Anything that's not within that context, it wouldn't execute it wouldn't put it on that stack as a function to address at all so now what we want to do is say here we have main function the computer is going to start from here let's legitimately call starts function and just say okay start do this and if you check this in nowhere here is the privileged function called at all what we want to do is be able to find a way to go from launching this 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 um um this target binary and be able to jump to privilege um, function hijack the control flow even if we're not allowed to do so hijack it and be able to get there um so taking it step by step you can ignore the set your id for now because that's important that's only useful in some other types of exploits but if you look at start the function calls main call start and um, starts and um, initializes a buffer here that we have the 50, the length of the buffer, the length of um, characters that are allowed into the buffer, 50 bytes, fine. Um, and then it prints to your terminal, it prints, please impute something here. And then what it does, it gets your input from um, um, st standard input on your terminal and puts it inside this buffer. But now here we're looking at something even though we've defined 50 bytes as the variable that should go into the buffer, here the fgets function is taking 512 bytes from standing into your buffer. And that's like literally going to overflow it. So one, what we wanna do is, yes, fill this buffer appropriately, but put extra logic into our, our whatever we send to the, to the utility that's gonna make it to jump to privilege function and hijack the control flow. And, and again, just recapping what we mentioned with the push pop and how it works on the stack. Here is how it to work from the bottom. So it always grows from bottom to top. Heap is the opposite direction. Um, heap memory is the opposite direction. But if we start here and you know, main, and we want to go from main to maybe start. Main is going to go away from itself. It's going to go from its own function. So it's going to say, let's go to start, but let's let the logic of the code know where to come back to when start is done. So it puts this return address here in memory and then goes to start. So we start, it starts here. It creates the space in memory for the first buffer, which is buffer 50. And then when you put your information in there, is going to fill into buffer 50. And if you put more than 50, this is supposed to be 50. If you put more than 50, it means you can overwrite what you have on the stack frame pointer. You can also overwrite what you have on the return address as well. And instead of it returning back to main here, 
what it would do is return to privilege function if you know the address of where privilege function is at. Um, finally, I'm just giving a full context of, of what it looks like before we go to the next bit. Um, so yes, you have your code, you have a, a bit of understanding of the theory of how that works. And here is a view of when you're doing your debugging um, in, 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 in GD or your debugger. This is how you can see us overwriting all of the all of the space in memory. You know, we put so much information in there such that it overflows it, and then we can have a, a, a way to hijack the memory. Um, I'm going to pause here before we go to the next view. And I just want to confirm that the other screen can be shared. Um, Sophina, sorry. Yeah, Deborah, 21. Thank you. Um, do you need me to share something? Yes, I'm uh, just going to do that right away. I'm just going to share my screen here quickly. Um, I, I don't have it enabled though. Uh, yeah, I think you have to pause, like stop sharing this okay. one, and then right. I don't, okay. I don't think you can share multiple screens here. Okay, perfect. Let me give that a try. And okay, I, I still have the same error. Uh, you should be. I'm gonna, I'm gonna text you on the actual one now. Okay. Oh, this one. Oh, right, right, yep. right, right. Got it. Thank you. Where is it on this RE? Shoot. RE map. Oh, one second. Now I'm trying to find it on. Okay. So, what's it called again? RE lab, right? Yeah. Why can't I see here? Yeah. Okay, got it. Thank you. Thank you. Yep, there we go. And uh, already, uh, just gonna go into this. All right, so here we have our code again. Um, and if we if we if we try to run this, right, this is the same. This is the same um, code we had before. Okay. So if we try to run this, it just you know says please impute something. We put some characters, and that's all it does. It returns error. Really doesn't do much else than that. But it's pretty it's pretty straightforward. Um, if we also do the check set that we had talked about before, check set binary, we can see all of the. Um, it, it, it's uh, running on Intel. Intel um, oh, 32 bit system. Um, the way the address it interprets the addresses is little Indian. I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit. Um, real role is partial, not full. We don't have any protection on the stack. Um, we we have the the stack as executable. So it's just so many so many gaps in this that are just um, very uh, not, not not good. Um, so if you do binary, you can do some more file binary. You can do some more um, checks into, you know, get more information about what it does. You can see elf that's two bits on um, Intel 8386. It is dynamically linked. Um, and you can see it has, is calling in this library from Linux to be able to execute its, its other functions. And this is another issue where you can actually use even the official library, um, Linux library um, utilities actually run one more exploits, which is the, the return oriented programming we talked about earlier. Um, so you can see it's not stripped up as well. More checks to just kind of like get an understanding of what's happening within your um, within your code, because sometimes you wouldn't have this. You wouldn't have this C at all. All you have is, you know, the binary application. And I don't know why I keep forgetting to put the slash. You would just be you would just be having the binary um, to use for your normal day to day work, or your team is developing it to to, to send out. Um, another thing you could do is check to investigate what it does. You can look at um, strings slash binary, 
and to run you through, you know, additional um, calls or strings that are within that particular application. And you can see one in control flow hijack. And that lets us know it's this part. And we're like, okay, we, we can't see this bit of code, but where, where does this come from? Because when we run the, when we run binary, it only does please impute something, you know? So where, where is one in control flow hijack? Maybe we can do more, let's investigate. Um, this is a good way to check using, you know, your um, terminal, but thankfully there are really amazing tools that have been built for this. And one I will go to is Jydra. And here in Jydra, I've already imported um, a folder, a project and the different binaries I want to decompile. So I want to go from just being able to run it in terminal to being able to see it as C, C lines of code as best as it, as it can predict um, or see it as assembly. So we click into the first one we have. Um, it tells us it's going to analyze this. We give it time to analyze. And here there's now, you know, a lot of code. So here, here you can see that, yes, we had just 21 or 21 minus six lines of code, but here there's so much more that's going on with this application than we expected. So there's so much we can exploit, so many different approaches we can take to, to exploit the system. Um, so first thing as usual, the way logic works is to go to GMA. Um, Nigeria, you have to be chasing them around. What is it? Nice, crazy. That's you. Can you mute your mic? Uh, okay, thank you. Um, so if you go back to, so if you go back in here, um, this is the best that Jira can do to decompile, assuming we don't have the lines of code. If you are doing a black box testing, if you're like a part of a security team, you can reach out to developers and check the lines of code. Sometimes you can't do that if a vendor sends you a patch, it's just you know what you need to install. So this is like the assembly language in the main function that we talked about. And you can see like load um, this address and do an and, do a push, do a move, do a push, sub call. Um, but it's more or less pretty to understand. It's just like knowing what the, the commands do. Here you can also see the specific address, the specific in instruction pointers in a sequential manner. So if I if I if I'm here, if I'm here, my code is executing um get UID and is about to call get UID, but I'm like, oh no, I don't want you to call get UID. I just want you to jump straight to start. All I need to do is specify this address in my in my exploit and it jumps to start. Um, if I wanted to do other things, I can also do that. If I want, if, if, if it's saying, oh, um, this instruction is saying add this number to the EBX register, I can say, no, don't add um, um, exadecimal 1A90, just add, you know, 0B, F0, or whatever else I want to manipulate what's happening on the stack. So yes, this is main, um, different calls are happening. That's where to identify how your control logic is going. Um, if you're going to start, just double click here, it goes into starts and you can see your prints, your um, defining of your buffer, um, your please impute something, get it from standard output. When it's done, return back to who called you. The person that called starts was, was main as the entry point here. So main was the one that called starts. So it would, result, it would get back here and it would return zero. We want to hijack this control flow and go somewhere else. We want to go from here to where is, what you can do is just go back here to this strange string that's here. Go back to your Jydra, which it makes everything amazing and easy to use. Um, click on strings and we just do a search for warning. So here we have that string. We don't know where it go, where it comes from. And we can see it here, okay. So warning entry points, where is the entry point for this? Um, oh, where is it now? Okay, let's go back here. 
the other entry points and go back up a little bit. Okay, I think the pilot, yeah, okay. Entry points up here with the address. Um, and back here. Okay, go up a little bit and, okay. So, okay. So here we have, here we have um, um, the privilege function as well that prints and when it prints it's pretty much put into screen here that prints that um string out to screen here and if you notice like this privilege function is not called from anywhere um in our main code it, even when we looked at um the, 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 com the compiled code here you know what is put into screen it wasn't called from anywhere but what we do have is a static address which is a serious vulnerability it has not a serious vulnerability, but a, a, a way in, in which memory works that can be exploited. So here we have 0804848E6. And what we can do is instead of the code going back to main, we just specify this address for it to jump to. Um, when we talked about the other um, vulnerability here, um, ASLR, address space um, randomization, layout random randomization, Typically, each time you run the code or run the utility, that address should always change in such a way that such static exploits wouldn't work. So if we if we are saying, okay, we want to go here, um, we want to exploit the, the buffer overflow that's happening in, in main and in, in start specifically, um, what, what exactly can we do? So we've gotten some context. Um, a good way to start is using um, cyclic utility to generate a long string. So, you know, instead of giving, um, instead of doing binary and AAA to know when we can overflow it, we can do a pattern that helps us know what's happening on, on in the environment. So I'm just going to do a cyclic of 1,000. Oh, cycle as usual. Um, I'm going to do a, 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 a cyclic of 100 characters. So. There's AAA, then it goes to BAAA, CAAA, and, and all the way down. Um, and then I'm gonna pass this really long string to, to, to the binary application, right? And um, let's let's see what happens. We get a segmentation false, and, and that's indicative of something wrong with memory. We, have, we try to access a part of memory that we're not allowed to access. Um, so that's a good thing to see from a security tester's point of view. Um, next, we're going to go into GDB to now step into the code to see what exactly is happening. So if you just do GDB and, and, and binary, um, I also have my um, pawn DBG um, utility attached to this. So it's going to load at the same time. Um, so the debugger stats um, here, I, I've already included my, my, my code. So I'm just going to click on start. Now, what this is showing you is the what is happening to the different memory addresses. So your EX register and all of that. But for this time, what we are concerned with is the instruction pointer. So we want to say, instead of going back to main memory from starts, instead of from here, going back to main where it was starts, it was called from, and then continue to return zero. We want to go and we overwrite this 94 with the address of the privileged area that we want to jump to. That's E6. So for this type of exploit, we want to just be focused on the instruction pointer and see how that changes. Also, see the similarity between the disassemble, disassemble code here and what you have in Jira. So GDB can also show you that, and you can just step in and see what's happening. So your usual get UID, set UID. And, and we're just going to step into this, right? Or we'll execute the next instruction. From 6H, it's going to go to 6B. It's getting information from the environment where it's executing the code. Um, we go to seven zero, still with the next instruction by pressing enter. And if, if you notice, EIP is also changing. So seven zero is here. That should go to seven six as the next instruction pointer. Um, and yeah, just observe that changing as well. Observe that changing. So you, you're able to monitor your registers or specifically for now, you're able to monitor your EIP register you're able to see how you're going through the code that you've, um, you know, you're looking back into from that you've decompiled. And then next thing that's pretty important is the stack. Now the stack is down here. 
and it's going to take the return addresses. So if I'm going to call start, the return address for where to come back to, so it knows it knows you know where to return to, it's going to place that on the stack for it to remember and, and call when it's done and, knows when, and know where to go when it's done with executing start. And then when it's done with, um, when it's done with um, start, it goes back. Or if it goes into start and it sees that, oh, there's a buffer that it needs to create of 50 bytes, it creates that on the stack as well. So ESP is your register for the stack. And you can just see that here and all the things that memory is bringing in to be able to work. I'm going to just step into this quickly until we get to the call to start. Here it starts happening here. And we're just gonna do another next instruction and you'll see we're going from main into start itself. Now notes the return address of 94, which should be updated on stack as well. Now we have input something. Let's go with our long again. And yeah, AAA QA. Uh, we've pretty much overflown the stack here. Let's do a, a, a bit of a view into what happened. Yeah. So if you just do telescope into the, the stack um, uh, in memory, here we can find the part of main that was affected. So here we had main happening and then from main function, it went to start. And then after it went to start, it's now going to create the buffer. And when we created the buffer, it took what it needed at the start and put that you know, in, on the buffer, but we were able to overflow the return address to be AA at QA. So that, that's a good thing, right? And we have a pattern here that can let us know how many bytes application I took before it's was able to manipulate our input took before it was able to manipulate the, uh, the return address. So we want to say um, AAQA to use our cyclic um, utility and do interpretation of AAQA. Um, okay. okay, so that's 62 characters um, before that happened. Now, this is good because we just have to craft uh, some lines of exploits that can make us to be able to, to to jump to the privilege function part and we can just quit this let the screen a little bit um and just let's see what that does again okay that works fine that ends there um but what we want to do is jump to control flow hijack and go back with our code so i'll do cyclic 62 was what we found and then I'm going to send in the address of privilege function. And let me just copy and paste it out here. Um, just so, oops, just so we have it there. So cyclic, and then I want to do echo, echo uh, E, and then the address. And we're going to write the address backwards because you know, when we did the check set or the checking, when we're checking the binary, it's in Little Indian. So the, the computer is reading it in, 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 in backwards mode. Um, um, X, E, 6, oops. Um, then, so it's going to be E, 6, 8, 4, 0, 4, and then 0, 8. So E, 6, uh, hexadecimal again, 8, 4, Hexadecimal again, uh, zero four. Hexadecimal again and zero eight, and I think that's it. So we want to type that to the binary target. So it's going to do the sixty-two. Now remember the pattern that we had seen here that showed the EIP was overwritten. We want to be able to manipulate it with this. So here we see this we were able to hijack the control flow. So it, it, it went to start here. It printed, please impute something. It's overflowed the buffer, but instead of going back to return main here, it went back to um, this part of the code. And of course, a memory jumped because our memory um, was corrupted in, in, in that process. So um, 
I think this is just a very quick high level intro to you know how reverse engineering works and kind of like a sample and the you know they are kind of like different places to to start from as well and you know feel free to you know ask any questions for myself or the rest of the secure, secure team and yeah always happy to help thank you awesome thank you deborah does anyone have any question we have i think we have probably we i'll stretch our time a bit but we could have some questions within like three to five minutes if anyone has any she said a lot of things. I'm, I'm surprised no one is asking in the chat session. I'm seeing like, I'm seeing Pond DB, DBD, and nobody's saying, oh, what's this tool used for? Why are you having this? Why is the bottom overflow 500 and not 100 or 50? Like, it could be right. because there's Google. <laughs> right. Okay. Google, Google, Google lords over me. But, hmm, interesting. Well, uh, yeah. Any questions from anybody? If someone is asking there. any recommended test books or? For yeah. them to read yeah um there there are two books that are really good to if you really want to go in depth um just read them like you're reading a, a novel the first is the arts of exploitation um and then the second is shell quarters um handbook uh i can just type that out here as well oh, okay I'll, I'll, I'll sign right I'll thank you Okay. You can just find the link on Amazon and, and send to the team. And, and so those two books are really good to start with. Um, another option as well, that is a quick start, is to go into, um, there's this channel that's really amazing, um, Live Overflow uh, on YouTube. You know, reverse engineering, go for it. Like, really great stuff on there. And then if you also go to ctftime.org, for something um, that could go around if your organization suffers a security breach, for example. Hi. <laughs> Hello, Deborah. Hi, okay. Hi, um, I have a question. So say you are exploiting a buffer overflow. You want to you want to do a buffer overflow attack, right? Yeah on the client side or somewhere what are the things that you need to keep in mind so what what are the things that could go wrong when you're doing this type of exploits and how do you mitigate against those things mm -hmm. it depends on the it depends on the type of test you're doing um if it's going to be black box or white box testing um so if it's something that you're going to be aware of you know you can run your test you've probably been given some other level of access that will you know let you do your work but i think for black box testing try to be as stealthy as possible i would recommend trying to avoid ids triggers um also avoid brute force <laughs> um so if you see here we went like step by step to go through the logic um it that's better to do than just doing trial and error because that would trigger alarms in almost any moderately secure corporate environments. Yeah. Um, so mm -hmm. do your manual tests in your separate environments and as much as possible, even if you're doing the remote hack, if you don't have the actual utility to, to test, um, you can um, do it step by step. You know, don't run too many commands at the same time and um, obfuscate what you're sending as well. You know, use like a secure, a, a secure, um, a, a secure portal to send your commands and yeah. Pretty much that should be able to help. All right. Thanks, Deborah. Thank you. Awesome. Great. Hi, Ronke. Are you ready to go? Yes, I am. Awesome. Yeah. So let's just like let's I'm going to share my screen now. Yes, I'm going to pause stop my own share. And all right. I'm gonna make you co-host. And the floor is yours. Okay, so you have to enable me to share my screen. Yeah, I just did. I, mm -hmm. I, I just made you a co-host. Okay, hold on, let me try again. Okay, so the thing is, I joined with two accounts. So can, can you enable okay. my other accounts what's, instead of this one? What's the second yeah. one called? It's, it's the same thing. Okay. Well, you should see another one with the same name. Right, 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 right. Okay. All good? Okay. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. um, let me know when you can see my screen, please. Mm -hmm. 
Hmm. I guess we pray that Spectra need to not test me today. <laughs> we can, yeah. but it's not full screen. Could, okay, yeah, perfect. It's not? Yeah, it's, it's fine now. It's great. It's great. It's great. It's great. It's good. Okay. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Ronke, and I will be taking us through how to investigate and analyze security events on Splunk. Um, a little bit about myself. I am a cybersecurity manager, and I have worked in numerous fields in cybersecurity from vulnerability assessments, you know, just name it. I have done a lot of things. So this is going to be a very basic course, very beginner friendly. We're not going to be discussing anything that is overly complicated. So just, you know, follow me and let's have a great time. Okay. Um, all right, so the course overview, I'm going to be going through a number of things. I'm going to talk about the domino effect, which is basically the things that could go wrong if you suffer a breach. It's going to look at why people put in so much energy to have security controls in place, right? We're going to take a look at the things that happen in a SOC. We're going to talk about operational resilience. We're going to talk about machine data. And before we go through with the Splunk demo, we are going to look at some basic components of Splunk that would make your understanding better before you know, we dive in, right? Okay, so there's something called the domino effect. It's not just a cybersecurity theme, it's a phrase that people use all the time. And what it talks about is basically a number of activities that could go wrong as a result of an action, right? So I'm going to put a question through to everyone. When a security breach or a security incident happens in organizations, what do you think some of the consequences are? Please feel free to answer. Don't be shy. So what are some of the consequences of a security incident? Consequences to organizations now. Anyone? Hello? Oh yeah, we're, we're in the chat. We're responding in the chat session. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I couldn't see that. All right. Loss of data, data breach, data loss, reputational damage, financial loss, loss of reputation, reputation. Yeah, that's good. These are all great answers. So my understanding is we kind of, we know what these consequences are. So I'm not going to spend too much time on them. But these are some of the things that, okay. So we have loss of business, loss of jobs, loss of customers, negative social media coverage, reputational damage, forensic investigation. Your regulatory bodies will be you know, all over you and telling you to do the right thing, contractual breach. There's a whole lot of things that can happen to you as an organization if you suffer a breach, right? Which brings me to why the need for a SOC is so, you know, it's what everybody talks about these days. This is why people have, like Deborah, Deborah spoke about um, defense and debt, right? Having a SOC, implementing a SOC is a defense and debt strategy, right? So you're doing this thing so that you're able to be resilient in face of an attack. Even if an attack happens, you're able to respond quickly in order to, you know, limit the damage to your organization, right? So we're going to take a look at what happens in this SOC. I know that a lot of us already understand what the Security Operation Center does, but um, I don't want to get into text and definitions and all of that. But for me, the way I like to see Security Operation Center is just something that enables you to the story. So I'm not going to be reading definitions, but some of the things that happen in a SOC, I have put down five different things here. Detection and prevention, this is like the most common one. I'm going to paint a scenario for you. Say you have a web application, right? And an attacker has found their way to the back end, the login page of your web application, and they keep trying different usernames, different passwords and all of that. And on the other end of your security operations center, you as a SOC analyst, you're able to see these patterns, you're able to see their tact tactics and their techniques and their attack vectors, and you're able to act accordingly. 
That is the general idea behind detection and prevention. Root cause investigation is just looking at how you drill down into these events to find, say, um, someone is launching like an attack on your network, you can drill down to find the source of that attack. So you're saying, show me the source IP address that is sending you know, these ridiculous requests to my server. That's an example of root cause investigation. Then there's log management, which is a big part of security operation center. And this looks at just turning your machine data, your logs into something that makes sense to your organization, if you get what I mean. So when you send your logs to a SIM tool, say Splunk, for example, it does a lot of normalization, a lot of parsing, it tags it, makes it into events, you know, it does all of that. So you on the other end, as an end user, you're able to look at your logs, you're able to look at your screen and make sense out of that data. Then we have, <clears throat> excuse me, threats and incident response. So a lot of times um, for say, um, companies in the financial services industry, say I'm a bank, right? I have a bank or I work in a bank. I'm trying to look at attack vectors that are being launched against my competition, for example. Are there some sort of attacks that my competitors see daily? I want to gain as much information about that attack so I'm able to prepare myself against those sort of attacks, right? So say there is a list of IP addresses. Um, these IP addresses are known for, are known to be malicious or are known to be associated with say command and control, right? I am going to incorporate that into my seen to, and I'm going to say, if any of my, if any of my assets or if any of my hosts are communicating with these IP addresses, then generate an alert. So I'm able to block, you know, these IP addresses. That's um, one of the things that Threat Response does. The other one is continuous proactive monitoring, which is basically just two for seven monitoring of your infrastructure. So you can stay one step ahead. Um, an, an example would be, there's something called user behavior analytics. And that basically looks at the normal behavior of an environment, right? It looks at the normal behavior of an environment and then creates a baseline for it and says, this is what is normal, right? If you see anything that deviates from the normal activities, raise an alarm, um, fire a rule, just let me know, right? That is an example of continuous proactive monitoring. All right. So down to Splunk. Um, I don't know if anyone has ever tried to go through logs, like raw data, like manually, just lines and lines and lines of logs I have. And it is the most tedious, one of the most tedious things you can ever do. It's, it's time consuming, it is not effective, it is tedious, you're tired. By the time you find what you're looking for, you might even be too tired to notice it, right? So this is where scene tools come in. You can take all of these data that you're generating from your, from your devices and pull them into Splunk, regardless of what that type of device is. It could be servers, Windows, Windows servers, sensors, virtual machines, web servers, applications, network devices, anything. You can say that I am going to send this data into my Splunk and my Splunk is going to interpret it for me in a way that is easy for me to understand and monitor, right? That is what operational um, intelligence through machine data is. You're taking all your machine data, you're putting it inside Splunk. Splunk is going to get your data, it's going to aggregate it, it's going to analyze it, it's going to tag it for you, create it into events, and it's going to push it to the end user. So you as a SOC analyst, it's going to be easier for you to understand and interpret those events. All right, um, so before we get into the Splunk demo, I want to tell us a little bit about some important components of Splunk that is kind of, that will aid our understanding of, you know, using Splunk as a tool itself. There are a wide range of components, but for, for this course, I've only put together three important components that you need to understand. The first one is Splunk Forwarder. A forwarder does exactly what the name implies, it forwards stuff. <laughs> It's going to forward your logs from your devices to your Splunk instance, right? So say for example, you have a firewall, right? You want to forward your firewall logs from your firewall to your Splunk indexer. I'm going to get to indexer as we go along. You want to forward your firewall logs from the firewall to the indexer. How are you going to do that, right? So you install something called a Splunk forwarder that is going to help you to do that. That is what a forwarder is. Very straightforward, very simple. Now Splunk indexers 
An indexer is, say, where all the magic happens in Splunk, right? If you ask me, this is the most critical part of the Splunk, the Splunk ecosystem. So an indexer, think of an indexer as a, a factory where you put in all your raw materials and on the other end, you get something that is edible or something that is safe for consumption. That is what an indexer is. So an indexer gets the logs from different sources. In this case, a forwarder and it processes the logs. It does normalization, it does parsing, it creates it into directories, it makes it into events. You know, it, it just makes your data more intelligent and more e like easier to, you know, um, investigate. That is what the Splunk indexer is. It's like the brain of the Splunk architecture. And finally, you have the Splunk search head. The Splunk search head allows you to search. <laughs> so think of how Google has all these Google servers, right? And if you want to find out something on Google, you just, you know, you do a Google search, right? That is exactly how a Splunk search works. It allows you to put in your search commands it sends it to the indexer, the indexer looks at the commands, it processes it, it sends the response back to, it sends the, excuse me, please, it sends the response back to the search head and then it is displayed to you as the end user or as the sub analyst. That is what a search head is. Okay, moving on. So when you index data, I'm admitting people into the, Zoom call in case I seem distracted. So when you index data, there are some metadata settings, default settings that Splunk attaches to your data, right? These are properties that are always attached to your events, regardless of what type of events you have. The first one is the source. So the source is um, self-explanatory. It's the path of the input file. So if you have, say for example, directly slash, directory slash she secures slash my Splunk data, that would be the source of your data, right? Um, host is where the information is coming from. It could be the host name, it could be an IP address, it could be, you know, anywhere, anything that uniquely identifies the source of your information is your host. Source type, now source type is very important in, in Splunk. Um, source type indicates or categorizes the type of data, right? So say for example, you have uh, a web server, a Linux server, for example, and source type is a field. So source type equals Linux or equals Linux secure. So it helps Splunk to understand what type of data it is. So that way it's able to give you the best information to process that data. And index is a repository of data. Now in a full-fledged Splunk um, production environment, you have multiple indexes. So for example, you can have an index, think of index as like different folders within Splunk. You can have an index for security events. You can have an index for sales events. You can have an index for Windows events. You can have an index for network devices. So if I'm going to my Splunk to search for say a, 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 um, an event ID for Windows, for example, I am going to go directly to my index for Windows, right? So I'm going to do something like index equals Windows and then I'm going to put my search command. So that way you're getting the best out of your Splunk. Splunk is not just searching the whole of the indexes and then it takes more time for you to get your results back and then you're wasting resources. So it's always good for you to know where exactly to direct your query. So it's, you get a more, a better experience with Splunk and you save your resources as an organization. So before we get into Splunk, let's look at a few ways you can get data into your Splunk. Now for a traditional production environment, you would have to use a forwarder 99% of the time. But because this is a test environment, we are going to use an option called the upload option. The upload option allows you to upload, a upload the data from your local machine to your Splunk instance. Now for this course, we're using Splunk Cloud, which means you are you know, going to your browser and typing in your Splunk Cloud link, and then it opens your Splunk for you. So you're able to upload data from your local machine that you're using for your Splunk. You're able to upload your data onto Splunk. Um, the monitor option monitors data. So for data that, data that is, so for example, like a script, you have a script that gathers um, user names and passwords from your application. And then the script updates the list of username and password. You can use the monitor option to say, Anytime there's an update, transfer the updates to, to Splunk. That's an example of 
a monitor option that you can use. And then the most popular one, and, and the most popular one would be the forward option, which I've already discussed. So let's move on. All right, so before I move on to the Splunk demo, are there any questions? Uh, sorry, can, can you not see my face? Oh, we can now, that was, that was an old message. Oh, okay. So are there any, any questions so far? Um, maybe mine. Are there any data that, or certain data that can be analyzed using Splunk or can we just view or just take any data set at all? Is there any limits to what kind of data you can filter through or use on Splunk? So can, can you ask that again? Yeah, I'm saying, are there any data? When you set? say what kind of data? Yeah, like, do, I think someone just asked that already. I, I didn't even see that. Well, like yeah. what kind of data, do we have a limit to, I know maybe you can talk about IP addresses or you can talk about maybe the systems or you can talk about where source and destination, but uh, let's say just normal raw data, like maybe names or anything else that doesn't have to do with network uh, security or anything can just long. No, have, it doesn't have to be network security. It can be that. any device within your organization that generates logs, which is, you know, all devices, right? So it doesn't have to be specific to just network devices it can be a windows server it can be your applications it can be anything really does that okay. answer your question yes i think more people are also concerned about the data someone said what kind of data can be uploaded to strong and, and deborah says plus one on the data type for the source of data are cloud apps as well in scope do we have cloud apps as well the... yeah you do have cloud apps your cloud apps will generate logs right then you can forward the logs to your Splunk. The type of data that can be uploaded to Splunk, I already answered that. It could be any data. If you have your logs, then there are some different types of logs that may need, you know, a little like configuration settings for you to like configure your Splunk so that your Splunk can, you know, respond to that or give you a better view of the data depending on the type of device it, device it is. Some devices are not as common as other devices, right? There are some peculiar devices, maybe like IoT devices, different types of IoT devices you would have to install like an app on Splunk that would extend the functionality of Splunk for Splunk to be able to display those events for you, if that makes sense, right? Okay. Why is Splunk preferred to other things? So preferred by who? That's my question. Um, <laughs> by, by, the industry, that, by the industry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, I, don't, I wouldn't say it's preferred. I know that um, when I was working in the security operations center, I worked with Arcsight, right? So I worked with different, like two different employers and they both used Arcsight. So from my perspective, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that Splunk is preferred, at least not in Nigeria anyway, right? So, but I think that for you to talk about preferences, you would have to kind of put your own organization in context, look at their licensing, how much data they allow you to index. So it, it depends on so many things. But I, one thing I would say for Splunk is that I find implementation of Splunk to be easier than Arcsight. That could be a reason. Arcsight can be, <laughs> Arcsight can be a bit complicated, right? At first, like when you see the screen, there's just like so much going on and it definitely takes you more time to understand Arcsight than it does for Splunk. So that is something I would say. Can I monitor privileged user access on a system using Splunk? Yes, you can. There, um, Francis, how do you forward a data from a device that, not, that is not compatible with Splunk forwarder? You have to install a Splunk app that would extend the functionality of your Splunk to be able to accommodate you know, the, this peculiarity that you've spoken about. There are different types of SIMs. So do, the competitive advantage and review of seem to see which, yeah, exactly. That's good. Thanks for answering that. So let's move over to Splunk demo. Before I start, is there anyone that has followed the guidelines and has Splunk Cloud installed or they have a Splunk Cloud account? Anyone? So I know what type of demo to do today. I'm going to assume no one. Okay, um, excuse me. Okay, so I can see some answers. Did you upload the data to Splunk? 
okay you have the data you have the accounts and data uploaded yes i uploaded sure okay great thank you guys all right all right all right if you've not uploaded your data i don't know if you can do that now it does take a bit of time to upload and there are time constraints so maybe you just follow me as i share my screen okay all right okay so um Lillian, can you share your yeah, I'll screen? I'll go ahead and, and share, share my screen on. now. Okay. Okay, let me just stop sharing. Can you see my screen now? Yeah. Okay. You can request for control. All right. Okay. Um, so, let me see, let me see, let me see. <laughs> Press control. Yeah, but uh, okay. Done. I have control, right? I have uploaded yeah. the files. All right. Thank you, Choma. Okay, great. Mm, all right. Okay, so before I start, just a little introduction to Splunk Cloud and the user interface. Um, so this is what is Splunk search head looks like. Sorry, I'm trying to see if anyone is asking me questions about Splunk, so. All right, so this is a search head, right? Remember I spoke about the three components of Splunk, um, the forwarder, the indexer, and the search head. So this is a search head. This is what you as someone who is involved in security operations, an end user, a SOC analyst, most times this is what you will interact with, right? But for people that are involved in um, SOC implementation, then they would be the one installing the devices, forwarding logs, installing indexers, you know, just in charge of configuration settings for your architecture, right? Okay, so let me just do like a quick intro to Splunk. Here you have like your search bar. This is where your search commands go. You have reports, alerts, dashboards, you know, you can just click that and Create a report, create a dashboard to give you a better view. This is a time range picker. So if you look to the right of the search bar, you see a time range picker where you can specify your time, right? But because we're using static data, we can't do seven days, you know, week to day to day. We can't do all of this because we uploaded static data to our Splunk. So we're going to be doing all time. So keep in mind that if you're doing any sort of search, please ensure that your time range picker, your time range picker is set to all time, okay? Um, scrolling down, you see directly under the search bar is the list, the number of events that you have. I'm going to be asking some questions about number of events. So that is where you can find the number of events. So to the left side of the screen, you have fields, right? You have selected fields and you have interesting fields. Now there are default fields that will always come with your events, right? You have host, source, and source type. Status is not one of them. I just added that when I was doing my own demo. So host, source, and source type. And like I said earlier, we, we already know the meaning of those fields, but there are default fields that will always be attached to your event. So if you look under the first event, right? If you look on that event, you can see host equals web server, source equals Linux, source type equals Linux secure, right? That is what I'm talking about. So if you scroll down just a little bit, you can see interesting fields, right? Interesting fields are fields that appear in your search more than 20% of the time, right? So if you're looking for, the way Splunk works is, or any other thing, so you need to know what you're looking for, right? So say if I'm looking for, Hold on now. A particular field, and I'm putting that field in my search bar, but the field is not one of the fields that have been generated by Splunk. It's going to give you an error. So if you are looking for a field and you don't know what field you're looking for, you can look at the interesting fields to kind of tell you what type of field that you should put in your command, right? All right, so let's get, let's get down. <laughs> let's get to business. I'm trying to scroll up, but... What's going on? Lina, can you scroll up? Okay, thank you. 
All right. So we're starting with basic keywords. Please feel free to follow through if you have your Splunk installed and your data uploaded. If you don't, just look at my screen and ask me questions or ask for clarification. I'm happy to answer. Um, so say for example, I want to I want Splunk to give me. Okay. I want Splunk to give me all events that have the keyword fail in them, right? I want to see events that have the keyword fail or failed or failure or whatever. And I only want to use one word. I am going to type fail and use a wildcard. So a wildcard is basically saying that anything that starts with the word to, with the word to the left of it, right? So anything that starts with fail, it could be failure, it could be failed, it could be failing, whatever, I am going to show you that. So if you click enter, it is going to give you a list of events that have the word fail in them, right? Mm, it's a little bit too slow for my liking. Uh, okay. So as you can see, you have a list of events that have failed fail, failure in them, right? That's just the first, that's how easy it is <laughs> to search Splunk. So the next one would be, let's try password. Oh. Sorry, it's a bit of a hassle sharing this. Okay. So let's say we're trying password. You're telling Splunk, give me a list of events that has the keyword password in it, right? You click enter, it shows you that. So you're getting my point now. So now there are things called operators in Splunk or in most sim tools actually. So there's or, there's and, there's not, things like that. So let's look into operators. Say I want to... Hold on, please. All right, say I want to see something with the event with the keyword fail and password. I am going to use an operator and to give me that, okay? Mm. Uh, fail, put a word card here because you might not have something that is just fail. So it brings out anything with fail as the first four letters, right? Mm -hmm. If you've done it, just let me know. Um, All right, this thing is a bit slow, so the commands are... Okay. All right, great. Well done, Chema. So failed and password implies that, show me events that have the keyword fail, starting with fail. It could be failed, it could be whatever. Events that have the keyword fail, well done, Javo. Events that have the keyword fail and password in them, right? So the two um, keywords have to be true for it to um, give you that event, right? Okay, so let's do or. So you're telling Splunk that I don't really care which it is, just show me events that have either fail or password in them, right? And then you put that in your search bar and it shows you events that have either fail or password in them, right? Now you're saying, okay, I want events that have the keyword fail, but they do not have passwords in them, right? They do, they do not have the keyword password in them. Does anyone know what command, what operator that's going to be? Not. Anyone? Not, exactly, that's correct. 
And yeah, and note that your operators have to be in capital letters. So you're saying not. So what do you have? The people that have done is, can you tell me the response you got from Splunk after you sent that command to the indexer? No results, that's correct. And what, what does that mean? What do you think Splunk is trying to tell you? Because it's one thing to, it's one thing to send your request. It's one thing to send your request to Splunk, but it's another thing to be able to interpret the response from the index. So if you don't know how to interpret your event, then investigation may be a little bit difficult for you. So can anyone tell me what this means? No result. Yes, I know there's no result, but what exactly is Splunk trying to tell us? Anyone? Okay, so Splunk is saying that I have searched all the events. Yes, that's correct. I have searched all the events in my indexer and I cannot help you unfortunately because I do not have any events that has only fail without the keyword password, the key phrase or the keyword password, exactly. So all the events that I have with the keyword fail in them also have the keyword password. Does that make any sense? Yes, okay. All right, so now here's a demo for So if you write a keyword and you don't use an operator in between, you don't use and, you don't use or, you don't use not, Splunk is going to imply that you mean and. So keep that in mind. If you don't use an operator, the result you're going to get will be one in which Splunk implies that you put the and command or the and operator, right? So let's move on into something that's a little bit more advanced. So let's say you want to, I just realized that I cannot, um, hold on. I have a PDF with a demo here. Lillian, how do, I, how do I share that? You know what, I'm just going to paste the question into, Lillian, are you there? Hello. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, yeah, I'm here. Yeah, how do I share? Thanks, Demolaya. I just saw your response. How do I share like the PDF that I have? You know what? It's fine. I'll just okay. put the the question in the chat mm -hmm. box. But the PDF has like guidelines, so I don't know how this is going to work. But I can guide you through. So it's fine. All right. So this is the first scenario that I want you to give me the results for. So I want you to find. Okay, there's a reason to believe there might be a security issue with your company web server. Your manager has asked you to explore failed SSH login attempts. I gave you a hint there because I'm very generous. But yeah, so I want to see failed login attempts, failed SSH login attempts. I want you to show me the results. So please do that and let me know how many number of events you come up with. I'm going to give three minutes for that. If you have questions while you're trying, I'm happy to help you and guide you in the right direction. So please feel free to ask me. Karen, great. this is not a question for the um, try the exercise. Someone asked a question earlier. So where is it? Where is it? Just at the top. They said, how are the fields generated by Splunk? Is it automatically generated based on the structure? of the laws or does it require human intervention to specify? It is automatically generated based on the structure of the logs. You know, even though your logs are a bit tedious to go through, they do have fields within them, right? Your log is going to show you the username is XYZ. It's going to show you IP address. It's going to show you all of that, right? Splunk just makes it easier to see. So Splunk will only work on your logs. If there are events or fields that are missing in your logs, Splunk cannot generate that for you. So it relies on the logs that it gets to be able to, you know, populate your events, right? Okay. Yeah. All right, has anyone tried this? If you're having any trouble, please let me know. You're welcome, Uchechi. Please let me know and I can help you. 
so you're looking for failed login attempts, right? Think fail, think password, think port number. How do you put all that together to get the total number of events? Mm. Okay, so B, B, I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name. B-E-A, that's how it's spelled. So can you try fail and 22 and let me know where you, let me know the results that you see. Let me know the things that are peculiar to your events. How best can you use Splunk for any visualizations? So I'll be, I'll be right with you, um, Shoba. So Shringa is asking me, how best can you use Splunk for visualizations? Okay, so there are things that you can, so with Splunk, there's something called knowledge objects, right? Those are the different things that you can do with Splunk. You have reports, you have dashboards, you have statistics, you have patterns, you have visualization. Those are some of the features of Splunk that can help you, you know, create something that it's easier to understand, like a bar chart, a pie chart, just things like that. Those are some of the features that are included with Splunk. And that's a bit out of the scope of this exercise, but you can use reports and alerts. So for example, you have a search, right? You've done the search, you say, um, show me client IP and number of tries, right? You can save that as a dashboard. You can save that as a report, then save your report as a dashboard and Splunk will interpret that and show you like a dashboard. That's, that's the basic explanation, all right? Um, fail or SSH. Fail and password and SSH. So I'm going to try some of these things to see. I don't know what the answer is. You guys will tell me what the answer is. I have no idea. Um, so trying to scroll. Okay, let me try the one by Shoba. Fail or SSH. All right. So Shoba said fail with the wild card or SSH. Hmm. All right, let's see what we have. We do have events. However, what your command means is that you're telling Splunk to show you any transaction that failed or any request or any response that has the word fail in it. That's one. You're asking for two things, Shoba, or any event that has SSH in it. Right. So the problem with this, I mean, this is very close to the answer, so we're done. But the problem with this is it's going to show you failed transactions that have nothing to do with SSH. Right. It's going to show you failed transactions from different other protocols. And that is not going to give you what you need. Do you, do you understand what I'm talking about? Yeah. And it's going to show you some events that have SSH in them. There are events that have SSH in them, but they are not login events. I want you to keep that in mind as well. So that is close to the answer, but that's not quite it. Let me take one more. Phil and 90. Okay, so what does 90 signify here. I want you to understand that we're talking about login sessions, failed login sessions. So you want to try to give, all these answers are very close to it, right? But in order not to waste our time, you want to try to give Splunk as much to go with as possible. So I'm going to try fail with my wild card. That's not it. Admit. Oh, this okay. 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 And I'm going to try and password. So the problem with trying 22, let's try 22 actually. Let's try 22 and let's see what the problem is. The problem with trying 22 is Splunk is going to give you all the events that have 22 in them. If you look at my screen, you can see even the timeline, right? The time range 22, 56, 31 is given to me. And I don't, I don't need to know the time. I just want to know failed logins, failed SSH logins. So you need to narrow it down. Your answer is included here. You know, it is here, but it's going to take you more time to get to it. So we're going to tell Splunk that I don't mean any 22, I mean port 22. Right, so I'm going to come here 
So another thing is if you're typing two things together, if you're typing a phrase instead of a keyword, you have to put them in quotes. So I'm going to say, show me part 22. Let's see what happens. All right, so this is my final result. You can see that it's no longer highlighting 22 as you know a requested field. It's just showing me failed password and port 22. Right. Okay. But thanks to everyone that, that attempted it. You guys did a great job. Now, okay, so let's just do one more, one more demo before we leave. Hmm. Okay, let me let me do an example. Just give me a sec. Say for example, you're looking for all transactions with status code 200. Now we all know the different codes for, you know, the web applications or the different error codes. Let me say there's 200, there's 400, there's 404, there's 504, we all know that. And 200 usually implies successful, right? So if I want to see successful events, Okay, hold on. Jovo says, I guess this is the same as fail and password and port 22. So yes, you're correct. That is the correct answer. Um, so say I want to see all events. We're still on operators now. There is equal to greater than, less than, greater than, equal to, you know, you know the vibes. You know the vibes. <laughs> so Let's say I want to see successful events. So I'm telling Splunk, give me all events that have status code 200, right? What do you do? I'm going to say, no, I'm going to use my index here. For this, for the purpose of this test lab, we only have one index, which is main, right? Um, status. Okay, this is first there. Status equals 200. Let's see what Splunk tells me. Get coconut heads. Okay, let's see. So here we're just saying, show me status 200. Look into the index that is main. Now, all of our events that we uploaded, they are all in the main index because we only have one index here. It's just main. I say, look into this index that has all of my events and show me the ones that have status equals 200. Show me successful, successful transactions, successful events, and all of that. So type that in and let's see what Splunk gives you. So obviously, it shows you the events and you can see. Now, I want to say, show me any events but the events that have status code 200 in them. And that would be, you would use not equal to 200, not there. So please make sure you're trying these commands with me, please. So you're going to use status is not 200, right? That is another operator. And it's going to show you all events. It's going to show you events that have status in them, but they do not have 200 as the value of that status, right? Okay. So now I want to, I'm going to post two different commands. Are you going to tell me the difference between the two commands? You can try them out and let me know. Cookie. Um, what was that? What's the chart? Okay. Mm. Hold on, please. When you say counts, can you can you expand on your question? When you say counts, what do you mean? All right, so I have two different search um, streams that I've posted in the in the chat box. Can anyone tell me the difference between Okay, first, is there a difference 
between these two commands? It's just typing yes or no. Let me know. Let me know what you think. Is there a difference between these two commands? I'm waiting. No, okay, okay, okay. Anyone else? Oh yeah, so that's greater than greater than 50. Do you get? You use less than, use the less than sign, less than 50. I hope I've answered your question. So anyone else want to tell me if there's a difference? Does anyone else want to tell me if there's a difference between these two search commands? No. All right. Let's see. Thanks, Francesca. Do you have the best participant on the shared on? Yes, I do. I will get to you. Um, Omori Sola Goriola. Hmm. Okay. So I am going to try the first one. There is a difference between these two commands, actually. And I'm going to tell you what the difference is. Just give me a sec. Um, I want to copy and paste so that I don't waste time. All right, so the first one is, what did I just copy? Okay, where is it? Chat, um, hold on please. Index, oh, it's the same thing. So the first one is, Index equals me status. So Splunk has something called the um, something called the search search help or search assistance that kind of gives you pointers and it gives you options. Is this what you're talking about? So you can see as I'm typing, it's giving me some options. That is a search assistant. Of course, you can turn that off if you don't want it. Status. Mm. Why can't I spell status, please? <laughs> um, is that it? Okay. Does not equal 200. Let's see. Also, if you want to know if there's a difference between these two commands, you can put in the commands one after the other and compare the number of events that Splunk brings back to you. If there's a difference in the number of events, that means the events, each event is doing something different, right? Okay, so this you're telling you're telling Splunk that I want to see events that have the keyword status in them, but this keyword status is not two hundred, right? So show me show me events that have status equals to anything but two hundred. That is what this command is talking about. But if we say the second one, which is not status two hundred. This is 15,000, over 15,000 events. If you do the second one uh, that has, not status, oh, what's going on? Um, William, please can you scroll up? This isn't taking so much, it's taking too much time. Okay, great. Um, all right, so where were we? Not status equals 200. Remember we have from the old command, we have 15,000 events. And from this one, let's see. Let's see, let's see, let's see. We can see we have 123,000 events, right? which means the commands are completely different from each other. The second command is telling Splunk that, show me events that does not have status equals 200, right? So it's showing you events that does not even have status in them at all. That is what this command is. So it's showing you every event for events that does not have status in them. So it doesn't matter what the status is. If it's saying not status equals 200, it's also showing, it's showing you events that have status 404, 500, 
but it's also showing you events that do not even have the keyword status in them. That's the difference. Okay, so I do have quite a number of lab exercises here, but for the purpose of our time, we're not going to be able to go through them. I am going to forward the PDF document to She Secures and they're going to send it to everyone so you can practice in your own time. All right. Okay. So are there any questions, additional questions? Yeah, there were a couple while you were speaking. So All the right. integrate Splunk into an on-prem server. So from Can you what? How do you integrate Splunk into an on-prem server? Hmm. How do you integrate Splunk what now? Into an on-prem server, you would have to integrate if it's a uh, I'm assuming that's a production environment, right? So it depends on the number of events that you have. So Splunk scales differently. If you are say a small organization with 50 people, you can you can implement your Splunk. Excuse me, please. Um yeah. You can implement your Splunk on just one, you can implement all your Splunk instances on just one server, right? So you have the part that does the forwarding for you, the search head. So the indexer and the search head can be on one server, right? It depends on the number of events that you're expecting. But if you're in a traditional production environment, then you need to allocate different servers for your indexes and you need to allocate different servers for your search heads. I don't know if that makes any sense. Okay. All right. Uh, okay. We have another one on how long does Splunk save your logs for your event? I think it's about one year, but you would have to confirm that for yourself. I'm not sure, but I think it's about one year. Um, what else? Any anything else? Best practices uh, that can be shared around. Okay, the best practices. Um, there are a few that I can say from the top of my head. I think the first one would always use a time range speaker, right? Mm -hmm. If you're searching for events on Splunk and you're searching all time, when you know that event you need is events from yesterday, you're wasting your time, you're wasting your company's resources, you're wasting time that can be used into immediate response, right? Immediate response and the immediate response and investigation, right? So always choose a time range. Another thing is to always index correctly, right? I know for this, we only have one main index, but you need to categorize your data, your logs into different directories that so that you're able to know that if I'm looking for an event from a firewall, I'm going to use index equals network devices, right? That way you search faster, right? It's mostly performance issues. Another thing would be use inclusions instead of exclusions. So say for example, I'm searching for access denied. You should search for access denied instead of searching for access equals not accepted, right? Access equals not accepted, for example, is going to give you all the different types of access except not accepted. While access denied is going to give you only access denied, right? So just there are tips and tricks there, but those are some of the ones that come to mind, right? So yeah. Um, what else? Okay, someone has answered the one year retention only is for Splunk Enterprise, okay. Femi says, thank you, Rowan Care. Excellent presentation. Thank you, Femi. All right. Um, if you don't have further questions, you share your slides. Sorry? Are you going to be making your slides available? Yeah, I'm going to be making the PDF available, though, not the slide itself. But I will send it across to She Secures and they can distribute that. Awesome. Right? Okay. Um, so. Um, how does Splunk handle log management with regards to storage, backup, archiving, and log integrity? You would have to check specifically for your environment. I know Splunk has a documentation that covers storage and backup and archiving and all of that. And I can send you that documentation. Just connect with me on LinkedIn and I'll share that with you because time is not on our side. Yeah, I think we're just gonna yeah. and Cass and Hamdi. They have like a closing yeah all right so if you have other questions please just send me a message on linkedin and i will answer your question but before i go i want to say thank you to everyone thank you for engaging and asking questions and thank you to lillian and everyone at she secures thank you for having me this is an amazing platform and you know yeah see you guys
um, hope, um, hopefully soon. So, bye. Okay. Thank you. All right. Ian, we're passing the mic to you. Yes. Hello, everybody. So I want to say a very big thank you to Deborah, Ronke, and everyone who joined us today. We had fun, and we'll show, I'm sure we've learned a lot of things today that we are going to be practicing. And we've shared a networking form for everybody who wants to, you know, keep in touch with um, all the participants of this meeting. And um, we also um, shared the Discord link if you would like to join the community. And follow us on uh, social media at she, she, she underscore she secures on Twitter, Instagram, um, LinkedIn. And if you want to become a member, get connected and yeah and feel free to send us feedback on the survey we are going to be sending to you and thank you so much for attending today's section and see you all bye 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 everybody